My name is Dr. Kevin Kirby. I'm a podiatrist uh, here in Sacramento. I grew up in Sacramento. I ran competitively for the Pachi High School and also for the UC Davis cross country track teams. And uh, so I'm going to, we're going to try to cover in this, we're trying to, we have an hour here from 7 to 8. I'm going to try to cover uh, topics of the most common running injuries of the foot, leg, and knee, and thigh. We're going to be talking about a little bit about running biomechanics. And we're going to talk about how you as runners, walkers, can treat these injuries yourself. And uh, just so to let you come an overview of the most common injuries, so that self-help type thing, but also teach you a little bit about the science of what we do as podiatrists and clinicians who treat these. So when we look at the, uh, the running gait cycle, the running gait cycle is uh, put into two basic um, phases. We have the support phase where the foot's on the ground. And we also have the what's called the forward recovery phase, which in walking we call the swing phase. Forward recovery phase, that's the time the foot's off the ground. So in running versus walking, the big difference between running and walking, in running where we have what's called a double float phase, where at one point of the gait cycle we have both feet off the ground, whereas walking we always have at least one foot on the ground. See? So that's the big difference between running and walking. So when we start looking at slow motion analysis, and let's see, she's going to start running here, hopefully here. We'll just visualize her running. She was running, she was running this morning. <laughs> she's tired. She's tired. Yeah, she's tired. I think she, there she goes. Oh, she had to have her goo. So, um, so this is actually a really nice website if you guys are interested in running bomb gangs. It's called Run Blogger, and Pete Larson is PhD. He he does uh, some writing on this. But this is a nice description. You can actually see here where there's a double where the foot is actually hitting the ground. And before right before it hits the ground, you can see that double float phase where they're actually you're actually in running, leaping from one foot to the other, and that's why we have the increased impact forces in running. Running typically is about uh, two and a half to three times body weight hitting the ground, whereas a walking is only about 1.25 times body weight. So the difference between walking and running is about two times more impact forces of the running than walking. Faster running is even, fa is even harder. When you go to a sprint, you're hitting with four to five times body weight. Long jumping, they've had ground reaction forces measured at almost seven times body weight. So jumping activities are greater. But you can see here, where she's sitting on kind of a midfoot strike on the left side, which is actually more of a heel strike on the right. So you can actually have people have asymmetrical or different foot strikes depending on the left and the right. This is another slow motion video done by the same guy. This is actually the 2010 leaders for the Boston Marathon in April of 2010. And you can see the variance of foot strike. These guys are all running sub five minute mile pace coming through this point here. And you can see the variation of foot strike. This is. There's Meb, he's running a kind of a heel strike. And then uh, this is Rosa Ruiz coming behind here. You know who Rosa Ruiz is? Remember that? That was a joke. Rosa Ruiz was a lady who jumped into the, into the, oh, yeah. become the beginning of, yeah, she rode a bike to. Uh, this is someone I know, myself. Uh, this, is, this is showing where I came from. In 1975, high school runner, 1979, ran the Boston Marathon with Fleet Feet when it was a big, a Victorian across the street. And then uh, 82 is when I was in peak condition. Uh, and when I had, I have these pictures up in my wall in my office, and people say, Dr. Kirby, who is this person? I said, That's me when I had muscles and hair. <laughs> that shows you kind of where I came from as a competitive distance runner, and now as a sports podiatrist, wanting to take some of the knowledge I've gained from all the years I've run and had injuries and treated them myself and lectured on this in national and international seminars, bring to you guys so you can kind of get some benefit from it all. So I can't talk about all the injuries. We don't have time in an hour. What I'm going to try to do is cover the six most common injuries we see, plantar fasciitis, plantar plate tears or metatarsal phalangeal capsulitis, Achilles tendonitis, medial tubus stress syndrome, Iliotibial band syndrome and patellofemoral syndrome. So first of all, we're going to look at the plantar fascia. And some of these are going to be some surgical. I'm going to have some surgical and anatomic dissections. If you guys are grossed out by this, 
this is what it looks like when we do surgery. I just did a surgery on a plantar fascia this morning. So, you know, this is really where you learn your anatomy and learn what your tissues look like that you're injured. When you hear about plantar fasciitis, there's the plantar fascia. Plantar fascia is this structure in the middle here, going from the medial band of fascia to the heel bone here, the calcaneal tubercle, fans out to attach to the bases of all the toes. Uh, it's the most common running injury we see. And when we see the pain in the back of the heel, underneath the heel, we call that proximal plantar fasciitis. Proximal means for the top. distal plantar fasciitis in the arch type pain. So these are very common running injuries. So here we have the, you can see the uh, drawing, Frank, these are Frank Netter's drawings. I think he's a famous medical illustrator showing the plantar fascia. The mid portion in the arch area, that's the distal plantar fasciitis. So the plantar fascia's main function is to help hold the arch up. It's like a, it's almost like a cable holding up a bridge. You can imagine a bridge and you had a steel cable running from one side of the bridge to the other. When a big truck runs over, it's going to tension up the cable. That's exactly what happens in the human foot. And this plantar fascia is the longest ligament in the foot. It goes all the way from the heel bones to the forefoot. And when you run and you hit the ground with two and a half to three times body weight, it puts a lot of loading force on it, stretches it, it pulls on the heel, and it also pulls in the arch area. So you can get, wherever the weak point is, it's either going to hurt in the arch area, you can get small tears in the fascia, or you can just get pain because it's pulling too hard on the bone. The other thing that we have to take into account when we talk about plantar fasciitis are these little muscles in the foot. We call them the plantar intrinsic muscles. And the plantar intrinsic muscles, everyone has these, and these are muscles that are like the small muscles in your hands. They help, help hold the arch up just like the plantar fascia does. So the plantar fascia and these little muscles, the plantar intrinsic muscles, you can see the layers of muscles here. They've stripped away the plantar fascia on the left here. And you can see the muscles sunk under the toes. That's the crux there. So when I did my plantar fasciotomy procedure this morning, I did a plantar fasciotomy. I cut through a little bit of plantar fascia. Right underneath it is that flexor digitorum brevis muscle belly, which is, see if I can point point my, there's your flexor digitorum brevis muscle belly. And these other muscles, they help hold the arch up, they help hold the digits down so the digits can flex um, uh, during gait, whether it's walking, running, jumping, skipping, whatever. So this is our, my little kangaroo, I've been in Australia a few times, but you see how kangaroos are all of these. <laughs> the reason I want to show you this picture is that the, the animals, including humans, use the long tendons, the energy storage of the long tendons to jump and run, actually improve the efficiency. And there's actually been a study done where they're taking cadaver feet, plug them in, <coughs> this is sort of arrangement here where we have the um, a load cell being attached to the tibia and pissing it up and down just like you're running, running and measuring how much energy return the ligaments and the plantar fascia can give. And they've actually measured, shown that the plantar fascia and the ligaments of the foot actually are significant contributors to absorbing uh, the shock and returning energy back to the foot. So uh, uh, animals like kangaroos, wallabies, horses, dogs, any of these uh, animals that have long tendons can use a stretch and recoil their long tendons to increase their efficiency. And that's, and that's one of the things that the uh, plantar fascia does. So like I said earlier, plantar fascia, the reason it gets injured in running is because it has to be one of these strong ligaments on the bottom foot that absorbs the tension forces required to help hold the arch up. In other words, when the foot hits the ground and running and it loads, it's going to tend to want to flatten out. But the plantar fascia, because it's like that steel cable on the bottom, is going to resist it. It's going to stretch and it's going to recoil and go into the next uh, the next um, phase. Can you give me a glass of water, please? I appreciate it. <coughs> I've already had a start. My day started at seven thirty this morning, so busy busy day. <coughs> so. One of the things that also happens is the medial tubercle, which is the weight-bearing surface of the bottom of the heel, can get impacted from running. So like if you're a heel striker, which about 90% of the runners are heel strikers, when you hit the ground, especially if you're trying to run in a, like a flat bottom shoe that has no cushion, or you're running on a hard surface, this can increase the uh, impounding into the heel and cause pain in that area. <coughs> Excuse me. So what are the treatments we do? The first thing we do is try to get people to stretch their calf muscles. So the gastrocnemius and psoas muscle, which are the two biggest calf muscles that attach to the Achilles tendon, 
these muscles, if we can stretch that, that, uh, that will help. And the stretching muscles, the stretching you actually would do would be like the wall lean, or you can get yourself a board that lifts your foot up. And that helps be, when you stretch the Achilles tendon, you stretch the plantar fascia. <coughs> icing therapy, what does icing do? It just decreases the inflammation in the foot. Over-the-counter inserts like orthotics. Um, so here at Fleet Feet, you have a whole number of these inserts. There be like uh, super beat insoles, mantra insoles. That's right on time. Mm -hmm. yeah, I should have brought a bottle of water. <coughs> Planet arch taping. Uh, I'll show that the description of that is helpful. Prescription orthoses, which would be something I would do. These are custom-made insoles. <coughs> cortisone injections. We give cortisone into the plantar fascia to decrease the inflammation. We use night sprints, which are, uh, in, there are like 90 degree uh, braces we put on the foot to wear at night to stretch plantar fascia. Ultrasound antiphoresis and also running shoes and non steroidal anti-inflammatory such as Motrin, Ibuprofen, Aleve. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so strapping. One of the things we can do to reduce the force on the plantar fascia and the plantar fascia is to strap the foot up. That's to reduce the tension on the plantar fascia. Here's our Achilles tendon stretches. Over-the-counter inserts. <coughs> Dr. Kirby, you want to recall that? That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I got a different variety. I, I'm sorry. I'm going through the same. I, I, you know, like I said, I, had a, I saw about 20 patients today, and it started at 7.30. And I normally don't get, but uh, you're a lifesaver. You're a total saver. <laughs> yeah, no, you're gone. And once my, my voice will come back. So on this, this say my voice, we can watch, this is my, from my Facebook page, talking about how to teeth. So you guys can do this yourself. Second one for the strip, we're going to space it by a half a width of the tape. You guys hear that? Yeah. So the medial and lateral aspects of the foot are covered by the tape. You can kind of see that on the side. And what we're going to do now is take the strip of the power strips and we're going to start laterally and finish up immediately. So these are the strips, so you do the strips on the sides first. The end of the first piece of tape goes right to the central aspect of the heel. And then you anchor, you put the strips across the bottom, that puts a whole sheet of tape on the bottom. This is KT and these you can use rock tape or KT tape, but it's much more stretchy, so you'd have to reinforce it. So I prefer the white cloth to use the This one's a little long, so it's a tear. What is a tear? That's something you can actually have patients, I actually teach patients how to do this, and they can start doing it on their own. They have problems every day, because tapes really be done every day. And the last strip on the bottom, you're going to take the this is a lock strip. So this will actually lock all the pieces together. And when we do this, I want to get the big toe dorsal flexed, and that will give a little extra arch height. So there's our low die strapping, and to finish up the strapping, we take a piece of two by two, two by two gauze across the top of the foot. And this is two inch tape. The anchor strips are one inch tape. We're just going to put it on like this. And this will hold everything together. And so when we get everything together, let's go ahead. Okay. So this is one way for us to allow patients to self-treat themselves because these tape jobs, ideally, are put on in the morning or just put on before you run and take it out. Because some people with resistance, this is what they'll do in a professional sports team, you know, basketball, football. Someone's plantar fasciitis, they trainers tape them up for every practice, tape them up before every game. So this is an excellent way of treating. It is expensive because each tape job is going to cost you like dollars, dollar fifty a tape. 
but it sometimes is very effective. So the next treatment work, I know what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave 10 minutes at the end so we can answer questions. So I'll try to go through all these, and then if you guys have specific questions, we'll talk about that. And thank you for the report. That's, that's, that's <laughs> so the next thing is something that's the newest. Now, when I was in school, this was I was in school over 30 years ago. We didn't have this diagnosis. This is called the plantar plate tear. It's also called predislocation syndrome. It's also called plantar plate dysfunction. It's also called metatarsal conjunct capsulitis. And the plantar plate is a kind of an oval shaped structure about that size, like if you took a small grape and cut a quarter of it off, that's what it looks like. It's actually a fibrocartilaginous plate that's underneath each of the lesser metatarsals. So underneath the second, third, fourth, and fifth metatarsal. And this is actually the section one of my friends, this is Larry Ford, is a biologist in the Bay Area who's uh, been a student of mine who did a really nice dissection and let me borrow it for and here you can see the strip of plantar fascia coming in, attaching to the plantar plate, which is then attached to the toe. So this is a drawing I did. I do a lot of lecturing and drawing and writing newsletters for, to, to educate podiatrists. This is a description of how the plantar plate relates to the other um, structures as a cross section. Here's your plantar plate attached to the plantar fascia attached to the toe. So the plantar plate, when we load the foot up, helps pull the toe down. So if the plantar plate tears, we get swelling, and we get the toe popping up. People describe a plantar plate tear as being somewhat like walking on a folded sock, or feel like they're walking on a um, uh, like a bubble gum or something like that. They, and they'll have pain in the area, and it can cause, over time, the toe to pop up and cause a hammer toe. But most people don't complain of the hammer toe. They complain of the fullness and pain underneath the uh, joint. And this is a drawing kind of showing the swelling that you'll actually, when you look at the bottom of the foot, you'll actually see that the, the little pooching out of the skin because of swelling underneath. The second toe is most common. This is actually a picture of someone with a pretty bad plantar leg tear. And you can see, and some of you may have feet like this, where you have a toe that's popped up. And that plantar plate tears, you lose the ability for that plantar plate to pull the toe down, and the toe starts sticking up, and then you can develop a hammer toe. So how do we treat this? One of the things we can do clinically, and this is something I've done many times here in my free screening clinics at, at Fleet Feet, is I've actually taken and added an accommodative pad to the running shoe insole, or an orthotic, so you can see an accommodative pad means I'm making a hole for the sore bone. See what I've done is take a piece of felt or you can take a whole shoe insole and you can duct tape it on the bottom of the shoe in that same pattern I have here to take the weight off the affected uh, toe. And this is kind of what we do with the orthotics. Orthotics are easier for me because I have all the customization uh, possibilities I can do with an orthotic. Uh, that we would do to try to make a custom plate that would have all the modifications like a metatarsal pad. But you can do it very simply for milder problems like I showed you here with a shoe insole and duct taping it uh, so you'd have a hole already of the sole metatarsal in addition to the icing and all the other stuff. Here's the other thing we do is this digital tape here. Here's another video showing me, again, from my Facebook page. You guys can go to my Facebook page and see these videos. Uh, so we are going to go ahead and take the first piece and just throw it in between the toes. This guy was a runner. He does up an Arnold up in the field. He, uh, he is actually a physical therapist himself. He came down and I got a like this. Or two foot like this, about 10 degrees dorsal flex from the weight bearing surface. So this is half inch cloth tape I'm using. So half inch is about that wide. Just right at the base of the tape, just up to the approximate flange joint. So that's the first piece. The second piece will go exactly over the top on the dorsal of the division, but on the bottom, you'll notice that I don't exactly overlap. I actually will fan it out so we get a better surface area of adhesion with the bottom of the foot. And then the final piece again go through the top at the exact same location and we come around in front on the bottom. 
So when we look at the final product on the bottom, it looks like this, kind of a V, square of V, and then on top, we can see that there's all the pieces are on the proximal phalanx of the digit, holding the digit, preventing the digit from dorsiflexion past 10 to 15 degrees. So, and that's it for the bottom brush taking things. So all you're doing with that taping, you're trying just trying to prevent the digit from going past this point, because when it goes to this point, that stretches the plantar plate. So it's almost like you do, like if you had an ankle sprain and the trainer taped up your ankle so it would move past a certain point. That's kind of what we're doing with this tape job. And it's very effective when you use this for people that have these so they can continue running. We have them self-tape themselves. So before they go for a run, they can tape them up along with an orthotic or an icing and all the other stuff. So what other things do we do for this? We tell people to avoid walking barefoot, avoid walking in thin soled shoes, you want to ice the area, uh, actually take an ice bag. You don't have to use any specialized. You just take a crushed ice out of the Ziploc bag out of the bag freezer, put it on the ground, take your sock off, put your forefoot right on top of that for 20 minutes twice a day. The taping I showed you, the modified inserts where we did the hole for the sore metatarsal, cortisone injections as they get worse or they're not responding. And finally, we actually, there is actually a surgery now to repair the plant that we use that's fairly effective. So we've done, there's a, actually just in the last two years, some new techniques where we go through the top. And this was actually out of a surgical discussion. This is a toe with plant plate tear on the second meter, uh, second day on top, and this is after repair occurred. You can see how that brought the toe down just by going underneath and repairing. So the third injury I want to talk about, and I'm sure you've all heard of this, and many of you have had this, is Achilles tendonitis. This was one of my first running injuries when I was in high school. There's many types of Achilles tendon disorders. I'm not going to go through all the technical names, but we have peritendonitis and tendinosis. But the bottom line is we have the, the tendon with a thin sheath around it, which is the peritinon, and this is, you can see on the bottom right hand picture, the little, um, little membranous uh, area around the Achilles tendon he's picking up, that's actually the covering over the Achilles tendon. So that can actually be inflamed. And sometimes you can actually feel, if you have a bad in the, if they, uh, Achilles tendon, you can rub your hands on the Achilles tendon, you'll feel almost like what we call crepitance. You'll almost feel like a crip, almost like a Rice Krispies type of feel. Other times you'll have the Achilles tendon where the tendon will actually get thick and swollen. That's a tendinosis. That's where you've actually had damage to the tendon fibers and the body is finding the damage by building up scar tissue. And you actually, you can see that from across the room. You'll actually see a lump on the Achilles tendon. And that's actually due to a tear, whereas a tendinosis typically will cause just kind of this, this crepitance when you rub your fingers out, you feel like a prickly part. So this is kind of a cross section through the Achilles tendon. Now you remember, the Achilles tendon is the largest tendon in the human body. So if you were to take your you were to take your thumb like that and look at it end on, that's about the size, the thickness of your Achilles tendon. It's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's a good size. It's, it's carried, during running, the Achilles tendon it has up to 890 pounds going through it for a guy my size. Uh, so you've got a huge amount of force going through the Achilles tendon when you're running, walking, obviously you're going to have less force going through it. Achilles tendon injuries are not just in the tendon itself, you can actually have them in the calf muscles, which are the gastrocnemius. The gastrocnemius is a muscle that is the thick muscle up here that attaches actually above the knee, starts above the knee, and then the one underneath the soleus is uh, the one that's kind of underneath it. And those two muscles combine to form this uh, Achilles tendon that then attaches to the heel, which again is the most, the strongest set of muscles in the human leg and the largest tendon in the human body. A lot of Achilles tendonitis will be right at the back of the heel here, just above the heel, at the narrow portion. That's where they think that the blood flow to the Achilles tendon is the least, so that's it's hard to um, heal that because there's less blood, less blood flow. The, um, I, there's this amyotennis junction. If you can see the, you see the upper, upper left arrow there, Pointing to that where the gastrocnemius attaches to the tendon sheath. There's actually a weak point there. Sometimes you can actually get a tear there at the what's called the myotennis structure. I just had a, a person come in last week. He had, he had been a work comp injury. He was jumping out of the way of a car. He worked for Caltrans. You know, a car was coming across, he jumped out of the way, and his calf hurt, and he swelled up, and he had torn the he had torn about 
about a half inch of his junction there between the Achilles tendon and the gastroc. So that's, you know, that, in, a, in an uh, athlete, that's going to be, they're going to be out of commission for probably about a month with an injury like that. So uh, in 2010, we had the bear running thing come up. Uh, I gave lectures here for that. Uh, I was actually got invited by Runner's World. If you want to type in my name into Google and Barefoot Running, you'll be reading about the stuff I wrote about Barefoot Running for about a day. Uh, you know, Runner's World interviewed me in 2010 about Barefoot Running. I was on the shoe side of the Barefoot Running debate. And I was, so after that, you know, the Boston Globe called me and the New York Times, they won because I was then the shoe person on the Barefoot Running debate. <laughs> Anyway, to make a long story short, the Barefoot Running fad kind of came on heavily. We got these uh, vibrant five finger shoes that became very popular, and then people getting injured and problems, and now it's kind of fallen off. So it kind of came up in 2010, and by 2015, it's kind of dead. And I guess other countries, there's, it's falling off too. So it's kind of a, and that's a whole story in itself, which I won't go into, but we did see a lot of Achilles tonight with people running barefoot and running in the lower heeled shoes. Um, more common injuries now, we see Achilles tendon, you know, guys who do a lot of hill training, guys charging up hills, running upstairs, uh, wearing, uh, going from a shoe that has a higher heel drop to a lower heel drop, that transition maybe from a standard heel of 10 to 12 millimeter heel drop to like a shoe that's a racing type of flat or millimeter shoe, sometimes for strain on the Achilles tendon, so we do see people getting that. And we also see, and this is actually a picture of Joan Benoit, who had won the Olympic marathon back many years ago. You can see here, as you can see the foot there, foot's really rolled in. Uh, you have that pronated, the pronated position of the foot as it, oops, pronated position of the foot, as it rolls in, it can put an, almost a ringing effect on the Achilles tendon, and we think that the prone, so some people who have Achilles tendon, nice, who's resistant to heel lifts and all that, we put them in orthotics, and sometimes that will uh, make their pain better. So things we do to treat the Achilles tendon eyes, or we try to modify the activities, get them off the heels, get them off the speed for a while, add heel lifts to the shoes, or getting them into a running shoe that has a little higher uh, heel drop. Uh, we're going to try at home, try to have them avoid barefoot, walking in a flat sole shoe, have them do the calf stretching exercises, which I've described earlier. Uh, icing therapy works really well. Uh, icing basically will decrease the inflammation of the peritinon and also decrease the pain. So some people will actually have them ice before they go off a run for about 10 minutes, run to the point where it's starting to hurt and ice afterwards. So you can actually do that. The icing is very effective at kind of numbing the area. You just don't want to try to run through extreme pain. Uh, a lot, of, I have a physical therapist here in close by to here that I use a lot for Achilles and ice. We send them out. When there's lumps on the Achilles tendon, you can do deep tissue massage, you can do ultrasound, you can do what's called iontophoresis where they're pushing in uh, cortisone with a, a direct current into the, through the skin into the area. And these are very effective treatments sometimes for um, Achilles and eyes. Like I said, prescription orthotics sometimes sell night splints. The night splint like I showed you that holds the ankle up at 90 degrees. That's, we have them wear that at night. Sometimes just stretching the Achilles tendon a little bit at night helps them. And also, one of the newer medications we're using, we use with Motrin, Aleve, and stuff like that. This Voltaren gel, how many of you have used the Voltaren gel? Have you guys any of you used that? Oh, wow. Okay, I'll talk about Voltaren gel. Voltaren is diclofenac. Uh, Voltaren used to be only formed as a prescription oral anti inflammatory, just like ibuprofen or Motrin and Aleve. In the past five years, Volterra now has been formulated into a topical gel. It's just prescriptions. So none of you can go that we write prescriptions all day long for Volterra gel for the athletes. It is actually like putting Motrin on your skin and having it going in without having to take it through the mouth and getting a risk of ulcer. The most interesting thing about Volterra gel is that we're about the only country in the world that makes a prescription. I was lecturing in South Africa and England last year. I went into the pharmacies there, it's over the counter. They have, you can buy it over the counter there, and you can also buy a Motrin gel over the counter. Mm -hmm. So these medicines now are prescription. Hopefully in a few years, the FDA will realize it's not that dangerous and they'll put it over the counter, but it's very effective. As long as the um, structure of interest is close to the skin, <coughs> the Volterra gel works well. 
The next is injury. There, is there a yes. equivalent of a natural um, essential oil infusion like that that's similar? I don't know. I don't know much about it. Yeah, the Voltaren gel is actually very effective. Voltaren gel is really pretty safe because it's it doesn't really go through the body. I've had I've given out probably 500 prescriptions over the past five years. I only had two people have problems. I had two real thin uh, competitive female marathon runners who weighed about 105 pounds, and they were getting stomach problems when they put it up. And so I think they just were so small it must have been. But it's a great medicine. It's, it's, uh, so there's really a very few side effects. It's much safer than taking ibuprofen orally, where you can get cells or so. Is it like biofreeze? I'm sorry. Is it like biofreeze? No, it's a, it's it's a, actually it's actually an anti-inflammatory. Because biofreeze mm -hmm. has caffeine in it, and that yeah, but got absorbed is, in my system and made me really sick. So that's why I'm just wondering. No, I, I haven't had that. Okay. Uh, but it is an anti-inflammatory. But it's it's it's, it's, well, it's not a cure-all, but. Certainly, I, I, I was. I thought maybe one of you would use it, but it's a lot of people. I'll give it to you for the foot. They use it on their elbow. They use it on the hip. You know, <laughs> put it on my back. <laughs> it's great stuff. So I, I have some knee problems. I rub on my knee every now and then, just when I, you know, I have done too much in one day. So the next injury we're going to talk about is yeah. For the end of the like the Voltaren gel, does that <coughs> really treat like make it better, make you in it? make the injury heal faster or does it just deal with well, that? Well, that's a good, you know, that's kind of a good question and I'll, I'll spend some time talking about that now because I get that question a lot from patients. Mm -hmm. So you got to understand that most of these injuries we're dealing with are injuries of inflammation. <coughs> you'll have a, you'll have a, a ligament like the plantar fascia or your ankle sprain or some part of the body that gets injured, there'll be a slight injury and the body reacts to that injury by sending blood and swelling to it and it creates the inflammation. That's what causes the pain. The body's trying to repair it, but you know, you can't run, you can't walk because of pain. Same thing with that plantar plank tear. If we can get the inflammation out though, then the function can begin. So we use a combination of icing, oral anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, Voltaren gel, and these anti-inflammatories are very effective at trying to reduce the swelling so that they can, you can still have function and not have abnormal function. Because I mean, if you're walking around on the foot of the sore and you turn your foot sideways and you get ankle pain because of that, that doesn't help. Obviously, with any of these, <coughs> there's uh, something like the anti-inflammatories are not going to block all the pain. You know, it's not like you're taking uh, morphine or heroin or something stronger that that's totally going to cork you out. This is a mild anti-inflammatory effect, but it is very effective. And we're looking at what are the weights? You know, what's the benefit versus the risk? The risks are very low, uh, except you know there are some uh, studies showing possible heart problems with long-term non-steroidal use. However, the levels we're using it, you know, we try to use as little as possible. But, you know, for short term, I don't think it's really a problem. So let's talk about medial tibial stress. And this is one of my uh, areas of interest. I've lectured on this quite a bit. Um, and this is another real interesting uh, injury that we see a lot, mostly in the younger runners. Um, we have uh, a high school coach here. And I've seen a lot of <laughs> their runners coming in, a lot of the young female runners and young male runners who are just getting into running will have this. So when we talk about shin splints, that's really not a good diagnosis. We call that a garbage bag terminology because it really doesn't, it's not specific. Um, so since our knowledge has increased, we're really able to now better understand a lot of these injuries that we've talked about. A medial tibial stress syndrome is the most common injury we see in the lower leg in athletes who are runners. The reason we don't like the term shin splints is because there's many other causes of leg pain. You can have a muscle tear. You can have an arterial nerve entrapment. You can have what's called compartment syndrome. You can have fascial herniations and you can have uh, other type of things like fibular or tibial stress fractures. So we try to be as specific as possible when we're treating patients, make a proper diagnosis so we know how to progress with our uh, treatment. Medial tibial stress syndrome is much more common in female runners. Uh, and uh, the male runners, and we think that's because women have thinner bones that are not as able to stand the load versus their male counterparts. As obviously as the girls or women get more conditioned and the bones get stronger, that goes away, but a 
a lot of these young ladies we're seeing in cross country in high school have never really done a lot of running sports, never played soccer, they get into running, all of a sudden they're doing four or five miles a day of running and they get this because it's almost like a pre-stress pressure. The pain from medial tibial stress syndrome is characteristically along the inside or medial border of the tibia, typically about two-thirds of the way down. And this, this is actually a patient of mine that I've actually drawn a picture of that where the pain occurs. Medial tibial stress syndrome isn't caused by one single event. It's not like you jumped down and got this. This is from repetitive activities. And almost 95% of them are in running and jumping athletes. Pain's going to worsen as the duration of the activity increases, and it's also going to be with running and jumping and not with walking. I mean, I've seen probably in 31 years of practice, seen two people have it from walking, whereas I've probably seen nearly a thousand athletes in 31 years have this as a, a, a problem. The thing about medial tibial stress syndrome is that they'll run, they have pain, they quit running, they walk for a few minutes, and the pain goes away. They don't have pain at all. You worry though when they say, gosh, you know, I, I was walking and it's hurting at night, it's hurting when I'm walking. Then you start worrying about not being a medial tibial stress syndrome, but a medial tibial stress fracture. And that's bad because a stress fracture, it may take three to four months to heal. You may not run for three to four months after a stress fracture. A medial tibial stress syndrome, a lot of times we can get them back from on the road within two or three weeks. We use plain films, which are not as good. That's a plain x ray. Bone scans, or we can do, that's a little bit old technology now, bone scan uh, 20 years ago, 20, 30, 25 years ago was the standard where you put radioactive dye in the body, it goes to the, the isotope, will go into the areas of maximum bone turnover, and you can see these little black streaks on the tibia here in the right hand picture showing these lines. Uh, right now though, the MRI is, is the uh, gold standard for diagnosis on this because it not only shows, if there is a stress fracture, it actually shows what we call bone edema, where there's actually microcortical fra fractures, micro fractures within the tibia, and you'll see actually water content increased in the bone. So the MRI is really the best uh, technique. So that's, we do order a lot of MRIs on people if we're there, you know, really worried about it, and we want to know how long it's going to take to get back to activities. So one of the things that's interesting about running versus walking, when we walk and we stand, we keep our feet fairly far apart. But in running, as you run faster, you actually will bring your feet underneath your body. So you're running and you're hitting like this, whereas in walking, you're going from side to side. And when you bring that foot underneath your center of gravity, that creates what we call a barris position. That means that the foot is swung underneath and the leg then shifts like this. So you can see on the diagram I have here, going from the left standing in the middle walking, and on the right running, you can see how we have to, in running, and not so much in slow jogging, because in slow jogging you're actually keeping your foot pretty side to side, but as you start getting around seven minute mile pace, six minute mile pace and faster, you'll start to see the runners actually putting their foot right on the line of progression, and they, they could run down this, you know, line on the road right on top of the line. And when that when that occurs, and this is actually a picture of me running when I was in podiatry school, is that when that occurs, I have, that's about a 15 degree angle of varus, is that when you start hitting on the outside edge of the foot, what that does is creates a bend in the bone and the tibia. In other words, the tibia is going to want to tend to kind of bend. I mean, look at the right hand picture, I'll go through the, see it kind of bending there, hitting ground more force. Actually, the bone will actually bend. Now, it doesn't bend that much. You're talking about maybe a degree of bend, but when the bone starts to want to bend, it puts stress on the uh, tibial border, which then over time, repetitive, you know, doing thousands of foot strikes, 10,000 foot strikes in a long run, you're going to bend the bone up. It can actually cause a stress reaction, and a stress reaction is what medial tibial stress is. A stress reaction is actually going to be micro, micro fractures of the bone that have not yet gone to a stress fracture. If you go further on though, then that's when you get a stress fracture. So we call it a bone continuum. In other words, it's a continuum. It doesn't just go from medial to a stress syndrome, medial to a stress fracture. It's kind of a continuum. As it gets worse and worse and worse, it can, if you ignore the pain and you're running through pain and you wonder why it took so long to get better because it can turn a fracture, maybe because you weren't listening to your body and 
taking the time to allow your body to heal. Okay, here it goes. There's Pre. <laughs> Steve Pre Fontaine, you guys know who he is? Okay. He was my hero when I was running. Pronated feet seem to be a risk factor with uh, medial tibial stress syndrome. And this is kind of the basis of the treatment. When we evaluate people who have this medial tibial pain, I'm looking to see if they have pronated feet. Because we know if they have a pronated foot with this, we can generally make it orthotic or take one of the super feet inserts here from fleet feet, build them up and make them better. One of the things we do is we try to reduce the inflammation, have them ice the tibia. We try to reduce the forces on the medial tibia with uh, the foot of those. These are a change in shoe gear. Excuse me. We're gonna, if they're weak in any of the muscles of the leg, we'll strengthen them. If they're tight, like in the calf muscles, we'll have a stretch. Alternative exercises. One of the newest things now is what's called gait retraining. I'll go through that a little bit. Gait retraining is kind of a new thing. It's been around for about five years now. And there's uh, some discussion and some scientific research now that's showing that you can take runners and teach them either to run with a shorter stride or maybe go from a rear foot striker to a four foot striking for some injuries. But in, in for medial tibial stress syndrome, they try to teach runners to not run with a running on varus, but to run with their feet farther apart. So one of the ways you can do that is if they're running down a, uh, let's say a playground that has a stripe on it, try to run on either side of the stripe with each foot. And so it's been some limited success with that. This real, it's pretty early still. So. I've used it a little bit. I've kind of got mediocre. I think a lot of people find it very unnatural to do that. Um, if you're running slower, it's not so bad. So I think a good thing to do is to try to take shorter strides, you know, increase your stride frequency, run a faster cadence, try to keep your feet a further apart. That is something you can do to treat this on your own by doing bigger training. And what we try to do as podiatrists or clinicians, we try to design a program, whether it's with orthotics or stretching, to get them back on the road so they don't keep coming back in to see me because I got, I got plenty to do. I don't, I'd, rather, I'd rather get them better and say, okay, get out of here and bring the next one in. You know, but you know, that's the goal here is to get the runners back to the, so they can train and train and not get injured and have fun. So this is the runner I, was, uh, I had showed you in the previous um, diagram. This is. Um, She's 28 years old. She was just starting to get into half marathons. Had really bad tibial pain were in the areas I've marked here where she really couldn't run hardly at all. I mean, she could run about 100 yards and had to stop. And she had donated feet. We made an orthotic for her. And when we did, it was a barest forefoot extension. What that means is we took the forefoot, since she was kind of landing on the side of her foot, I brought a wedge under her forefoot, so I brought the ground up to her foot along with the orthotic. And she did really well with that. She was back to running like a mile or so within a few weeks, and then within a couple months, she had no pain. So, and this was all we basically all we did. We got her into anti pronation shoe, got an orthotic, and she was a happy camper. It's not always that easy. I mean, sometimes we treat a lot of high school runners. We do, and actually, that's the largest proportion of people I see with this injury. We treat a lot of high school runners, and typically, once they come in as freshmen and sophomores with this injury, we make them the orthotics, and by the time they're seniors, they're, have, they're running you know, 70 miles a week with no pain. Uh, but you know, that, that orthotic early on gets them past that, that get, allows them to get stronger so that you know, they may not even have to use the orthotic after two or three years, but they typically do, but that's, that's the way it works. You gotta get the bones strong to avoid this injury. Stretching, icing, <coughs> anti pronation shoes, Reduce training mileage and intensity, temporal orthotics, like I've shown you, we can do padding into the shoe, uh, custom orthosis if we need to, and daily training like I told you, and also we'll do a bone scan, preferably MRI scan if we think there's a tibial stress fracture, but only, only if it's going to really change our treatment. If the patient says, you know, I, I'm treating one of the weather people here in Sacramento who has this, and uh, she's on the news um, every day, and you know, I was, uh, I said, okay, we can do an MRI scan, but it's really not, I'm still going to have you in a boot for a while. And, you know, she decided, well, and, you know, I don't see the purpose. I was, you know, we're just going to get her back to the road when she can start doing it. So that's kind of what we do. We talk to them about the cost because MRI is, is about a thousand dollar test. So it's pretty expensive. So we got a few more, then we'll take some questions. Iliotibial band syndrome was my very first running injury. I got that when I was 16. Mine was caused by me letting my shoes get too worn out. 
the inner tier of a band typically is going to cause pain either on the laterally here, and it's the most common cause of knee injury, and you can also get it here, up in the hip, and also along there. So the inner tier of a band runs all the way from here on down the side and attaches down below the knee. Here's a picture of the inner tier of a band. It's actually a sheet of long ligament or tendon flat across the body. You can actually see someone who has a very, you know, doesn't have a lot of fat on the legs. They have tense up their quads. You can actually see a nice flat area there. That's the other two of band. We see this a lot in runners who have really pronated feet. Uh, we do get runners who have weak gluteal muscles. When I say gluteals, I mean the gluteus medius and minimus, which are muscles here that attaches here. And when those get weak, the other two band has to work harder to hold the hip up. And we can see it kind of pull, and we, we, then we get them on strengthening exercises for the gluteal. Probably because, it's probably caused by poor running mechanics or abnormal foot placement. So a lot of times we'll get them to shorten their stride, uh, doing stretching. And let's just talk about some of the treatments here. Icing therapy, we'll do the gluteal stretch, strengthening exercise, which I'm going to show you. ITB stretch exercise, which I'm going to show you the next slide. Over-the-counter inserts have been modified. Physical therapy is very helpful, including ultrasound, stretching, iontophoresis, prescription orthosis if we need to, and then the Voltaren gel and uh, anti-inflammatories. So iliotibial band stretching. Uh, these are some of the stretching exercises you can do. The foam roll, which I'm going to show you next. Uh, it's really easy to cross. It's, it's very easy to stretch the iliotibial band at the hip, but it's very difficult to stretch it at the knee. And so we've, uh, the thing we're using now is a lot is this foam roller. And the foam roller is, is you've got to be careful with this because you can put too much pressure on the foam roller and bruise it. So, you know, there's people that get injured from using the foam roller. So, you, so if you see how she's doing this here, you want to support, if you're going to use a foam roller for that, you know, you want to support yourself with your upper body and maybe the feet so you have some pressure on the on the O2 band and kind of rolling your thigh over that, but you don't want to put so much pressure on you can't walk the next day, right? So, uh, you know, so that's, you got to be careful with the foam rollers, but they are pretty effective for the band. The gluteal strengthening exercises, for, oops, sorry. Uh, the gluteal strengthening exercises, you can do those either with the knee flexed, but you're basically laying on your side and doing this sort of thing, or you can do it like this, and what that does is strengthen these, these gluteus minimus and medius muscles so that they're working along with the other two band to take some stretch off the um, leg and the, uh, take the, make the other two band better. So <clears throat> things like also we see runners with the other two band syndrome when running on the side of the road. So we try to have runners not run just on one side of the road where you have a camera service, we have a switch roads, switch sides of the road or run on the middle of the road if you can. So you gotta be careful of having any angular placement of the on the road. And if you're getting lateral knee pain, First thing to do, uh, look at your shoes. If your shoes are starting to get lateral, shoe wear, get a new shoe. So the last injury we're going to talk about is patellofemoral syndrome. This used to be called runner's knee or chondromalacia. It's now called patellofemoral syndrome. Pain's going to be directly under the kneecap. This is much more commonly seen in women runners and in men runners. Um, it's going to be worse with sitting. So you're one of those people that sit down at your desk and your knees are flexed and you get up and feel like something's stabbing you with a knife under your kneecap, that's probably patellofemoral syndrome. So we'll, we call that the theater sign. People go into a movie theater for two hours, get up, and they feel like they can't walk because their knees are sore. That's, we see that a lot with patellofemoral syndrome. Pain's made worse going up and down stairs. Much more common in women than men. One of the things we see with patellofemoral syndrome is that the kneecap is not tracking properly on the groove for on the femur. So when that kneecap starts moving to one side, this side, it the, no longer is it rubbing, going gliding smooth, it's hitting up against the side of the femoral groove and wearing away the cartilage and causing bone bruises. So one of the things that we think causes this are in women we're going to see increased Q angle because they have wider hips. We can have a weak thigh muscle and where it's not pulling the kneecap into its proper position, and also the foot rolling in where it's pronating too much. So our tight hamstrings are tight in a band. Uh, here's the picture of the Q angle. Q angle is simply the angle between the hip to the knee to the tibia. Women, because the wider hips are typically going to get a higher Q angle, this increases the pull of the kneecap toward the side. So you'll see probably about for every four four of these patellofemoral syndromes, there'll be one man and three women. 
So treatment, we're going to try to strengthen the quad muscles on the side, uh, do hamstring stretching, we're going to be doing eye swing, we're going to be doing the anti shoes and also possibly orthotics. The, the conal taping is very effective. I'm not going to go through that, but that's basically where you try to pull the kneecap over with tape. And this is something the physical, I don't do this, I send this to the physical therapist to have that done. Uh, we can reduce the stride length, uh, do over-the-counter inserts or strapping of the foot and uh, prescription orthosis, and also non -steroids. So, and I'll just show you one, my, one last picture. This is the Aggie Running Club. I was, I was uh, at Ramsey Aggies at UC Davis. We were, I was in the first group of runners that did the centipede, so we were, we were the ones that invented the centipede. That's me, about the guy behind the red hat, that's me, the red red wig, that's, that was the very first one we did, that was in 1978. So, uh, running increases impact forces, like I told you, we have three times body weight with running versus 1.25 with walking. Uh, you're hitting the ground harder, your foot's pronating more, there's more stress on your tendons, ligaments, and bones, and this is what the injuries occur. These increased forces increase the risk of injury with running, uh, but at the same time, there are treatments that we can do using uh, common sense therapies. We're strengthening, stretching, foot inserts, uh, taping, strapping, uh, just trying to do whatever we can do to reduce the stress, decrease the inflammation, putting people on sometimes alternative exercises so that they can, uh, so that they can continue to uh, stay in shape. They name it. Now, running, we may be having them do uh, biking or elliptical train or rowing machine or swimming while they're you know still staying in shape. So then, then gradually easing back into running. This is the way. This is what we do in as sports uh, physicians, sports podiatrists, and I'll allow in order to allow you guys to continue competing and uh, and running and just having fun. So I'm going to go ahead and we have about. Uh, eight minutes here uh, for questions, so I'm open to questions now. If anyone has, uh, and thank you for that. That was, that was <laughs> my voice is back tomorrow. I knew it'd come back. It was, <laughs> I was a little scared there for a while. There. I was getting worse. Yeah. So, would your general rule be if it hurts, don't run on it, um, or is there any time you can like okay. run on? Another good pain? question. <laughs> so, so when you. So the question, the question is, do you, if it hurts, do you run on it or not? Okay. So let me give you a little guideline. Typically, if you have a pain that is present with running, and you go farther and farther, and it's getting worse and worse, that's a bad sign. In other words, you start the run, and you're feeling good. After a mile, your knee's hurting a little bit. Two miles is hurting more, three miles is making you limp, you need to stop. What that means physiologically is that you're continuing to injure the area and you're injuring it more and more and inflaming more and more as you go farther and farther. That's not good because that means you're not correcting the problem, things aren't loosening up, that sort of thing. However, if you start the run and you're a little tight and a little painful, and you get into the run, and all of a sudden, after a mile or two, the pain is getting better, that's okay. Obviously, if it comes back again, it starts to get worse and worse, you've got to stop. So there's going to be many injuries as they heal, because there's scar tissue and there's inflammation, that you can run on it initially with a little pain and go slower, and then it will warm up and feel better. So that's actually, that's the kind of the guideline that I always used when I was competing, and also as a sports guide. So, um, yeah, it, you got to really listen to your body, though. There's been a lot of people that think, oh, I'm Superman, I'm Superwoman, I can do this, you know, or they have, they're under peer pressure, all my friends are all going to run 10 miles a day because they're training for half marathon, and I will, uh, no matter, no matter how things are going, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know, quit running, you're not, you know, because in, in theory, I mean, in general, if you, if you got an injury, I mean, for example, I mean, this is stuff, stupid stuff I did when I was, you know, in high school, I had a blister on my big toe and I got a new shoe. So I said oh, I had to do a 10 mile run that day. So I went and ran 10 miles with a blister on my toe. And, and I didn't want to, because I did, I wanted to run 70, 80 miles that week. I couldn't miss my 10 mile day, right? Well, what did I do? I ran on the side of my foot. I got a tendonitis. It took me three weeks to get over the tendonitis. 
Whereas if I just had rested a day, I probably wouldn't have had a problem. See what I'm saying? Is that, you know, we get really competitive and we get really um, focused on that we got to do this, we got to do that, instead of using, stepping back, using common sense now, you know, what's the harm of me maybe riding a bike today because I got, you know, getting on, go to the gym, lifting weights, going to the swimming pool, you know, versus going out and running and limping. And when you're limping, you're straining different areas of the body. You're um, hurting other structures, and you may get an injury of this. And typically, in Murphy's Law, says you're going to get a worse injury from compensating for a mild injury than you would if you just had taken a day or two off and let it heal. Yes? I heard up there, it seems like most, most every injury you had came along the word uh, pronation. So for those that have it, um, <laughs> proper shoe fit and or orthotics? Uh, is there well, anything you know, else? It, it not, okay, I guess I, I, I kind of picked these injuries out because these are most common. And most of the people that, most of these injuries are going to occur more people that have pronated feet. But that doesn't mean people with normal arch feet can't get it. Uh, and these are not hard and fast rules that if you're prone, you're going to get these injuries. Uh, you know, these are what we call risk factors. So not everyone with pronated feet is going to get ill to your band syndrome. We just see these patterns. But in general, if you have a pronated foot and you've been running in a comfortable shoe and not getting injured, I would don't get orthotics. Don't okay. get orthotics just because someone told you a pronated sure. feet. But if it progresses, then what else? I mean, if you start having those? symptoms, I mean, what you're looking for is symptoms. I mean, you're starting to get arch pain or knee pain, and you know, everyone tells you a flat feet, and I mean, you come to fleet feet and say, man, you need some. Super feed or go to the providers, get the one you know, you may want to look into that. But just because you have a flatter foot than normal, there's some of the greatest runners in the world that have kind of flat feet and never got our pies and, you know, we're running world class. You know, so the pronated foot is just one little piece of the pie. But certainly, you know, if that's something that we can treat, because we can treat the pronated foot with the orthotic or strengthening exercises, and that's helpful. So it's, we call it, it's called multifactorial. In other words, there's many causes of these injuries. It's not just pronated foot. It can be tight calf muscle. It can be stupid running. You know, you're doing a training regimen that's bad for you. You're running too much too soon, too fast. Running on the wrong surface. You're, you know, there's just so many causes of bad shoes, the wrong shoes. So that's why it's difficult for you guys as people who are non-medical to know what causes it. Sometimes you need some help to see someone who's experienced to guide you along the way to find out what's the cause. So that's, that's really, I think, the important thing. Not just looking at the foot structure, but looking at all the other factors that go into causing these running injuries. This is you had a question? Yeah. Um, what do you do when your injury becomes chronic? So the question is, what happens when, you, when the injury becomes chronic? And that's, that's when you start to, you know, you need to start to seek help because you've tried all the self-help things, you've read the books, you've talked to people, that's when you've got to go see your sports podiatrist, your sports orthopedic surgeon, you know, to see the you know, physical therapist and see what direction you take. Because that's, you know, some of these injuries, I mean, there's, you're going to have at some ages injuries that will, that won't allow you to run. I mean, you get bad knee arthritis, you can't run through that. If you get a rupture of the Achilles tendon, your Achilles tendon is chronic and painful, you know, you know, so there are some things, you just don't want to get to that point. So it's better to step back, so if you have a chronic running injury, it's not getting better, you got you should seek medical help to see if you can't find a solution. That's, that's my recommendation. If it's an injury that kind of came on and kind of goes away, you don't need to see anyone. But if it keeps coming back, I mean, that, my, my experience for running, I was running in high school, I was running 70 to 100 mile weeks in high school, so we would do, you know, we would do double workouts, I was running and that was in the era of post Frank Shorter era from 1972 to 1975 when a lot of us boys were running uh, a lot of miles because that was what people did to be better. And so I was getting injured every every two to three months. I get a new injury. So like I get Achilles and ice or, you know, and I was frustrating. And then by the time I got to UC Davis and ran for their teams, I was, you know, frustrated of all my injuries. I was, I was still a good runner, but, you know, you work yourself up to get try to get uh, you know a good time or beat your you know do well for the team and you be injured you have to take two weeks off of running and then you go back up you so for me um, 
I heard about a podiatrist and heard about orthotics and Ronnie's world. I went and got orthotics from him and I didn't get injured for two years. From my soft, from my freshman to my junior year at Davis, I went a full two years of running 70 to 85 miles a week with no injuries. For me, that was significant at first because I had been injured over three months. So that was my, that's what got me into podiatry. Because, you know, I said, wow, this is cool. I mean, it's these little plastic things in my shoes that took care of my injury problem. You know, and, you know, and I read about it and all that, but to me it was like huge. So, but you know, I was a competitive distance runner, so that was, that was my, other than getting good grades in school, you know, that was my life. So, um, so that's what we do, you know, you just, you, these chronic injuries can really sap not only your ability to get better as a runner, you may not be competitive, you may just want to run for fun, but uh, you know, when, when you love running and you can't run, there's nothing worse. So, so this is, this is, did you have a question in the back there? Yeah. I was wondering, like, I don't have pain when I run, but if I, before a race, if I stand still too long, my hip, I get a pain in it, and my foot will go numb. Oh, really? You know what might be causing something like that? Are you standing on just one foot or both feet? Both you get, feet. Do you get that with, do you get that when you stand? It's like, just my left hip, like. No, do you I get that when you stand without running in before yeah. races? Yeah, if I stand still too long, so. Yeah, is it up in the forefoot or it's, underneath the heel? Pretty much the bottom and the heel of the foot, so. Do you have a high arch foot? I think it's average, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can get what's called, there's, there's, it's not very common, it's called compression neuropathy. It's, we get that a lot in the people who do elliptical. How many people have done elliptical trainer had a little t tingling in their toes afterwards? That's it. Compression around. That means, so when you're doing elliptical, you don't want to lean forward because that puts all the pressure on the forefoot. So to get rid of that pain, extend your arms and lean back and heels when you do it. And I'll take care of it. And that's the same thing there. It's just a chronic. We see that in bike riders. Uh, and we, we see the numbing toes in bike riders because of the chronic forefoot pressure. We see it also in elliptical. People use elliptical trainer. So it could be just, you You know, you could try one of the over-the-counter art supports here. and. See if just evening out the distribution of pressure on your foot will allow, you know, a little cushion and that's that's that'd be what I try first, stretching your calf muscles too. Well I think oh one more question, I think we're about done. I had a bad case with plantar fasciitis about ten years ago with cycling that healed and started running around half a dozen half marathons without an issue. Um, you know, was standing on a ladder and shoulder pain and I think caused a couple of recurrent spasms in plantar fasciitis and now it's just killing me. I wear one trail I've got to wear, I know I'm in the right shoe. I've had to stop running for about three months. What are the steps you have to take going forward? Uh, kind of what I you know, showed on the slide there, you, you, know, you may, if it's really bad, sometimes we put them in a boot, a walking <coughs> boot, like a brace boot. Uh, just to, if it's really bad or you can't walk without discomfort, we do that. Cortisone injections, if it's real bad, that does you know, knock the pain down. I mean, like some people are so bad we have to do surgery. That's not not in the runners too often, but I see a lot of. I probably see more male carriers than anyone in Sacramento. I, I see today. I saw. Yeah, I, I I'm like the postal service best friend. So <laughs> I, I see today. I saw three letter carriers, and I'll, uh, every one had plantar fasciitis. So um, yeah. So this is. This is, uh, yeah, so what you got to do is get, get set up with someone who can kind of evaluate you, make sure you don't have a stress fracture, but you know, things, to, as you start elevating the level, something can try the lower levels, cortisone injections, putting in a brace, getting a good old custom lock that is really a form fit, getting, you know, stretching, making sure you're not doing stupid stuff like walking on barefoot on the floor at home. You know, we a lot of people waiting for bladder machise. I hear a lot of my just have them stop the from walking at home. I have to get Crocs. Crocs are like a thirty-dollar sandal. I don't know if they sell them at Fleet or not, but they're just I have them. You know, they're just a soft, have a little arch, and they're thirty bucks. And you know, they oh my God, it's like I'm better already if wearing Crocs. I mean, it doesn't cure it, but just you know, these are it's, that's why I say multifactorial. You got to look at all the factors that can cause that and eliminate them. So. Get people on the road. Well, thank you all for your thank attention. You. And, uh,